Good morning, Libertopia. Yeah, Here's the bottom line. Statism rests on a massive failure of imagination. The statist wants people to cooperate with each other, but bizarrely supposes that the only way to persuade them to do so is to use monopolistic force. The statist thinks people should be shielded from violence, but can't imagine that they might be able to be without the overhanging sword of Leviathan. The statist believes it's important to protect people against poverty and economic insecurity, but seems to think that we can't cooperate effectively to help others unless a coercive monopolistic authority manages our helpful actions and decides how it's best for our resources to be spent. The statist wonders who could possibly resolve disputes in the workplace, prevent abuses, stop pollution, and thinks that only monopoly government could possibly do that when the answer is obvious to the question who will, the answer is we will. Who needs the state when we can have anarchy instead? Anarchy is what happens when peaceful people interact on the basis of voluntary cooperation. It beats rule by the state any day of the week. Governments, we know this, governments, monopoly governments are rooted in the use of force. And that means no actual government is legitimate. And in any case, we would be better off without the state because we can do what its proponents say it's supposed to do more effectively and efficiently than it can. We can defend ourselves against aggression. We don't need the state to force us not to kill each other, and we don't need the state's help to coordinate our interactions. Working together voluntarily, we can create meaningful lives and livable communities. Now, it's true that the word anarchy sometimes raises red flags. Sometimes people wear the anarchist label or hoist anarchist black flags when their primary goal really is just to spread a little chaos. Even people who know better may sometimes use anarchy as a synonym for disorder. But anarchism, as I understand it, and as I'm confident most or all of you understand it, is about the best kind of order imaginable, the kind that emerges voluntarily, spontaneously, as people work creatively together to shape their lives and plan their futures. Anarchy is what happens when social order flows not from the state's gun barrels, but from the free choices of fearless people. I'm an anarchist for several reasons. I'm an anarchist because I don't believe there's any natural right to rule others. I believe people are equal in essential dignity and worth, which means in turn that they have equal moral standing. That makes it hard to justify giving some people, those who rule the state and those who enforce the ruler's decisions, rights that other people don't have. I'm an anarchist because I believe the state lacks legitimacy. Now, some people say that rulers have more rights than others because the ruled have consented and continue to consent to this arrangement. The fact is, though, and we all know this, and other speakers over the course of the weekend have highlighted why this is so obvious, they haven't. We haven't. We haven't given them their consent, and we're not going to. And that means that their claim to be legitimate, their claim to enjoy their supposed rights, is a fraud. I'm an anarchist because I believe the state is unnecessary. Statists often maintain that having a state is the only way to have a peaceful society. But I believe non-state institutions can provide the services the state provides, but more efficiently and flexibly. And I'm also convinced that if the state has the power to do good things, even very good things, very useful, very important things, it will almost unavoidably use that power in authoritarian ways. And use it, of course, to do bad things. It will suppress harmless behavior on the part of ordinary people. It will acquire more power 
there is good reason to ensure that it never gets started down the road to greater power. I'm an anarchist because I think it's obvious that the state tips the scales in favor of privileged elites and against ordinary people. Now, if you listen to good government types, you'll think that when that happens, it's something odd. It's a fluke. Let me tell you something. Tipping the scales in favor of elites is not a bug. It's a feature. That's the way the state is supposed to work. The state tends to promote inefficiencies through subsidies, monopolies, patents, tariffs, and other mechanisms that allow elites to avoid paying the actual costs of what they do and reaping monopoly profits at the expense of ordinary people. The state forces ordinary people to bear the costs of elite decisions and to adjust their preferences and behaviors, our preferences and behaviors, to suit conformist majorities. I believe a stateless society would be more likely than ours to foster efficiency and productivity and to avoid varieties of hierarchy and exclusion that states tend to promote and protect. I'm also an anarchist because the state tends to be destructive. Have you noticed? It engages in war and plunder. It oppresses. It's violent. A stateless society would feature far less large-scale violence than ours. I'm an anarchist because the state restricts personal freedom. I bet you've noticed that, too. As a way of maintaining order, benefiting the privileged, preserving its own power, or sometimes just subsidizing some people's moralizing preferences. Finally, I'm an anarchist because I want a society that is marked by diversity, exploration and experimentation because I believe states impose conformity and resist creativity and because I believe a stateless society would provide opportunities for people to explore diverse ways of living fulfilled flourishing lives and to put the results of their experimentation on display. Now the state has been with us in one form or another for a long time. So it's easy to treat the existence of the state as unavoidable or inevitable, but there is nothing necessary about the state at all. States persist because of the self-interest of the powerful people who manage or manipulate them and because ordinary people haven't realized their own power to imagine and implement alternatives. Now, the reality is that this capacity to imagine alternatives is attacked at every turn. The media promote deference to military intelligence and police agencies. They valorize authoritarian behavior. Most of us are perfectly aware that the Bush administration actively promoted, for instance, the use of 24 to legitimize torture. Power tends to corrupt and power tends to consolidate itself. We see this in all kinds of ways. You know, at the national level, the imperial presidency continues to grow with support from across the mainstream political spectrum. If you want to know how bankrupt and fundamentally deficient that mainstream political system is, notice how every participant in it cheerily supports the growth of executive power. There's uniform membership on the part of establishment politicians in the war party. But the irony, I think, to some extent, given that these folks, many of them are legislators, is that they're also all members of the imperial presidency party. Every party wants the chance to control the imperial presidency. At all levels of government, there is growing confidence in unaccountable expert managers. And state power tends to feed itself. Once an entity has power, it's most unlikely for it to give it up. I've had enough of that. I've had enough of that. It's time for anarchy. It's time yeah. for anarchy. Yeah. We can take the first step toward realizing anarchy by breaking the hold the state still has on people's imaginations. I think it's marvelous that this weekend's amazing Libertopia convention, at which I've had an unbelievable time, happens next door to the Hollywood Expo. The fact 
that next door to us are people committed to envisioning an alternate world, to envisioning an exciting, peaceful world, is really amazing. I don't think it's a coincidence that there are so many libertarian and anarchist science fiction fans. Because if you're going to believe in the possibility of a better world, it sure helps to have a good imagination. Once we realize that the emperor is not wearing anything at all, and once we help other people realize the same thing, we can really begin to make progress. The state is simply a group of people no different from your neighbors with no more authority, no greater right to tell you what to do. And when we begin to strip away the illusion that the state is anything other than that, we make a huge difference. It is a pure myth that the state represents us in any meaningful sense that when politicians and generals act, they're acting on our behalf. The people who make and implement state decisions are pursuing their own agendas, very often in conflict with our interests, just like powerful people do in, in other institutions, often in, in large organizations. You know, a lot of us have seen increasing evidence of this in the research that's come out, a lot of it actually just in the last year or two, highlighting the similarity in personality type between the people who rise to the top of organizations, certainly including states, and sociopaths. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. So it's funny then that despite all of the reasons to doubt that the state has anything to be said in its favor, there are still people who think it can be fixed. There are still people who hold the bizarre notion that really all we need is to throw the rascals out. And there's something just, I think, deeply bizarre about that. They think if corruption is eliminated, if the right politicians are elected, if this or that reform is implemented, things are going to be OK. Now, obviously, things are never going to be OK as long as people exercise illegitimate authority. But even if you put aside the issue of illegitimacy, it's just bizarre to think that rotating a few people out is going to make a difference. It's bizarre because, first of all, the people in charge are not a random sample of the population. As Hayek famously said, you know, the, best the worst come out on top. We've already talked about the fact that the sociopaths get selected for leadership positions. In addition, people who might be fairly decent when they find themselves in positions of power are, are likely readily to succumb to the temptations associated with that power. Furthermore, even when there are genuinely well-intentioned people, they lack, this is the point of all of the knowledge arguments about the state, they lack the ability to make good decisions. They don't have the knowledge. Nobody has the knowledge to make the decisions that states claim to be able to make. And so even well-intentioned people are going to screw up. And when they have access to the power that the state affords them, their mistakes can have devastating consequences. Bottom line, the state isn't going to be fixed. We're not going to be able to fix the state, nor do we have any reason to want to do so. The problem is not that this or that group of people run the state. The problem is the state. The good news, though, is that ordinary people can craft and maintain effective ways of living together and solving human problems in the state's absence. I am convinced that life without the state will provide lots of opportunities for diverse cultural forms and ideological convictions to come to expression. And I suspect that the most effective way to move beyond the state may involve practical experiments in doing without it right now. Now, the reality is I'm not in principle opposed to attempts to use electoral politics to challenge the state, but I think they're dangerous and they're often likely to be ineffective. I am excited by what I've seen here this weekend as people have talked about other possibilities. Great time at the Lola anti-war presentation yesterday, for instance, as people talked about the value of building agorist coalitions with people in areas like the underground dance party movement and the health food movement, who may not think of themselves as libertarians or anarchists, but who fall under the heavy hand of the state and can see the advantage of crafting a social infrastructure to which the state is just irrelevant. 
I think those kinds of experience, experiments certainly deserve continued attention. Now, anarchists often spend a lot of time imagining what life might be like without the state. And that's a lot of fun. Uh, I confess, I don't know. I don't have a plan. And if I did, I certainly wouldn't want to impose it on everyone else. The good news, maybe the best news actually about anarchy, is that there are more ways than you or I or anybody else can imagine to organize communities and solve problems. That's the point, right? That's why we don't want the state, because the state imposes uniform solutions to problems. I favor, therefore, what is sometimes called panarchy or anarchy without adjectives. A stateless society ought to be hospitable to all kinds of different ways of being human. Now, I'm unapologetic about the fact that I'm a market anarchist. I favor human interactions in and through markets, both in the narrow sense of the cash nexus of commercial transaction and in the broad sense of the sphere of voluntary cooperation, which obviously includes kinds of interactions that aren't narrowly commercial. I'm a market anarchist and I'm happy with that. I'm happy to defend it. But I think a stateless society ought to be hospitable to everybody from primitivists to technophiles and transhumanists, to proponents of markets and enthusiastic supporters of gift economies, to atheists and fundamentalists, to advocates of individual and communal ownership, localists and cosmopolitans. I don't want to impose a single vision on anybody. I want a world in which people can explore possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> decent voluntary communities and networks, and of course, just as is true today, decency won't be universal, will help people resolve disputes provide protection against violence and injustice and risk, help to safeguard people from the effects of economic insecurity. But how this happens, what priorities it makes sense to adopt, how tasks will be allocated among the different overlapping communities and networks and associations with which people are affiliated, that's going to vary from setting to setting and that's okay. Different approaches will reflect the experimental creative process of discovery and invention that anarchy will make possible. There will likely be all sorts of communities in any imaginable stateless society. No doubt some of them will be geographic, so it'll be easier for people to manage some kinds of tasks by working together with people who live and work near where they do. A voluntary association of people operating a local hospital, for instance, will likely be made up in general of people who are geographically proximate. Moving people's bodies takes time and uses resources, and People presumably like to be able to take advantage of hospital care for their bodies quickly and efficiently. Of course, there will be no state, even in this case, to insist that anybody living in a given geographic area join a particular association or enforce any such association's demands for tribute. And there won't be any border guards or passport offices to keep people from moving to geographic region to geographic region, and so from affiliating with different geographically based associations. But at the same time, of course, I think many communities just aren't going to be geographic at all. I think it's a failure of imagination to suppose that most communities in a stateless society have to be geographic. I think they often need to be, ought to be deterritorialized. For instance, Something like the ancient uh, law merchant might be expected to govern certain kinds of economic transactions. People interested in taking advantage of a consistent set of rules for such transactions might belong to virtual communities, linked by the internet and built on interlocking networks of trust that connected them with each other as they moved and worked into diverse geographic regions. These voluntary virtual communities could provide a range of services to their members, dispute resolution, for instance, grounded in principles widely shared among their members. Membership in such communities might make it a lot easier, in fact, for people to establish trust-based relationships with those who would otherwise be strangers. And members who exploited other members' trust obviously would soon find themselves without the benefit of membership. You don't need geography for that. People of all sorts who are willing to live peacefully to allow members of their own communities opportunities for exit and voice can contribute creatively to the ongoing process of experimentation and discovery that will enable a stateless society to flourish. Not all communities are going to work well. 
right? I think that's just a given. Some indeed may be dysfunctional and even destructive, and many will doubtless be committed to visions of the good life that are quite different from mine. That's okay. Who's going to decide what life looks like under anarchy? We will. All of us, through the innumerable individual decisions we make in communities and workplaces, associations and spontaneous gatherings, whether they're geographic or not. What will the plan, the system, the dominant norms look like? There won't be a plan. There won't be a system. There won't be dominant norms. There will just be the diverse plans and systems and norms created and maintained by genuinely free people in a dizzying variety of environments and following an unbelievable wealth of patterns. Now, as I've said, I've got fairly strong convictions about how I'd like to see things work without the state. Some of my convictions are moral. I think some things would be unjust and exploitative and subordinative and exclusive. Some of them are practical. I think authoritarian bureaucracies, for instance, just aren't very good at managing the production and distribution of goods and services. Now, I wouldn't hold these convictions if I didn't think they were plausible, if I didn't think they made sense, if I didn't think they were consistent with experience, but I recognize that I might be dead wrong about any number of my specific convictions. Indeed, that's one reason I find anarchism so appealing. Without a little cognitive humility, it's easy to assume that I've got a model, I've got a plan that's just right for everybody, and all I need is the right sort of benevolent philosopher queen to implement it. But of course, it's that kind of naive idealism about the capacities of states and the motivations of authority figures that's gotten us into the mess we're in now. The mess in which the state exercises enormous power and dominates our lives. If you think the experts can get it right, then you've delivered us into the hands of the state. Accepting that some kind of cognitive humility makes sense, that I might well be dead wrong is a crucial reason not to support some kind of cookie cutter standard to be imposed across the board on communities in a stateless society. Anarchy will give people the freedom to experiment, to figure out what works, to test ideas and ideologies, and figure out what happens when they're actually put into practice. Now, here's what we have to expect. Some options are going to work well. People will improve on them and refine them, and others who observe them in practice will emulate them and they'll spread. Others, on the other hand, we know this in advance, some are going to be disastrous. People are going to abandon them with relief. And others will likely prove stable enough that people who are attached to them will preserve them and try to muddle through. The point is that only by trying things out are we going to figure out just how much merit options really have. One side note here that I think is pretty important, an advantage of this kind of experimentation ought to be pretty obvious. If it goes badly wrong, it goes badly wrong in a way that affects a much more limited number of people than if the state does something that goes badly wrong. When the state screws up, the results are catastrophic. When people in a voluntary community screw up, things are bad, but they don't put the world at risk in the same way. A large-scale state can do far more harm than a virtual or geographic voluntary community. Now, that doesn't mean that all options are equally okay. This is not moral relativism or moral nihilism. I'm not arguing that because there are going to be different possibilities on display, all of them are equally good. I'm not saying that we somehow can't make good judgments about what's right and wrong, good and bad. I'm not saying let's just throw that out the window. Being an anarchist doesn't commit you to being a relativist or a nihilist. But there are all sorts of ways of being flourishingly human. Viable human life doesn't require we all follow the same cultural patterns, endorse the same mores, inculcate the same folk ways in the next generation. Now, for instance, some people thrive in bustling, open, cosmopolitan environments. Other people, I pretty clearly, prefer the stability and familiarity of relatively self-contained communities. As long as nobody in a given community is coerced into conforming, enslaved, prevented from leaving, as long as everyone is treated decently, then 
there's no good reason for anybody else to object to the existence or operation of a given community. Individuals and networks in a stateless society can and should help those who are trying to escape slavery, free abuse, or overthrow tyranny. I think individuals can and should challenge cultural patterns, communal institutions that oppress and exclude, but that's not an argument for having anarchist busybodies spend their time trying to remake other people's communities, make them look like their own. And practically, of course, people are just going to lack the time and the energy and resources to engage in interventionistic manipulative campaigns at the drop of a hat. This costs money. Under the state, you shift those costs to all sorts of other people. But if you have to bear the cost of being a busybody yourself, there's a considerable disincentive to being one. We can also hope, of course, for mutual tolerance among members of different voluntary communities and networks, at least sometimes within limits, right? I mean, the state depends on the widespread acceptance, bizarre, unfortunate, of the legitimacy of its authority. Similarly, a stateless society is going to function best when people internalize norms that allow different groups, different voluntary, peaceful, cooperating groups to coexist. Now, obviously, it may not always be efficient or required for people to actively intervene in unjust situations, but real injustice can never be treated as trivial. Again, I'm not saying ignore the injustice, but the reality is it's very easy to start treating other people's peaceful voluntary communities as if they were uh, sources of uh, sin and evil that ought to be wiped off the earth. We see states do this all the time, and there's clearly good reason for a stateless society to feature an ethic that makes that kind of violent, apocalyptic response uh, not viable. Respect for other people's freedom and dignity certainly ought to create a presumption, even if not an indefeasible one, against attempting to reshape their ways of life. The experimentation that happens in a stateless society can't happen if you and I are constantly trying to tell other people how voluntarily to live. I mean, in the widespread benefits, of leaving different groups of people free to explore different voluntary strategies for living well will give everybody a reason to let the process of discovery within multiple communities continue. As a general rule, the reality is, I think we've all observed this, people learn most effectively not by being lectured at, but by seeing and experiencing for themselves. If I participate in the life of a particular community, I will benefit, certainly, from the ongoing discovery in that community of what works and what doesn't. But I also recognize that the success of my community will make it easier to share with other people ideals that matter to me, to put them on display. Seeing those ideals put into practice, other people will be more likely to acknowledge their value and to respect my community and the way it works. In turn, this also means that communities which peacefully, voluntarily, explore ideas that are dramatically different from mine, even diametrically opposed to mine, actually in some important ways do me a favor, do other people a favor. If they work, they challenge me to discover new human possibilities, possibilities I might have been inclined to ignore. And they help me to remember that I'm not at the center of the universe, that everything is not always as I perceive it, and that things are not always what I expect them to be. They contribute to the ongoing process of liberating me from my preconceptions, from my unwillingness to be surprised. On the other hand, obviously, if they don't work, that helps too. Because if they don't work, they're not working, takes a bad option off the table. Other people see that they don't work. Other people realize then that some options just aren't viable. Clearly, the collapse of the Soviet Union has sent a very dramatic message about some options that don't work. Anar anarchy is ours to create. So how do we get started? Now, different kinds of anarchists will be inclined to chart very different paths toward anarchy. And I think there's merit in lots of different strategies. I think a lot of them are complementary, and I think most of them are certainly worth considering. One of the basic convictions underlying anarchism is that people are wonderfully, gloriously, startlingly diverse. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to working for anarchy. And that's, first of all, because I have no 
illusion that most people have any obligation to focus on deliberately pursuing the emergence of a stateless society in, in activist fashion. Lots of people do that for their own reasons, in order to escape the tyranny of the state, in order to realize a better world. But I certainly am not arguing that everybody needs to uh, focus on being a full-time activist. People have different goals, commitments, concerns, interests, responsibilities, and passions, and that's okay. And second, even for somebody who does make activism a priority, there is no single right strategy to pursue. And that's true because the free choices of other people always render the outcomes of our actions uncertain. It's true because even if nobody had the capacity for free choice, there would be no way to tell just what the results of pursuing a given course of individual action will be. And it's also true because there are so many different reasonable ways of identifying goals, there are so many valuable goals, and there are so many sensible ways of realizing these goals. So I have no mandate for anybody, no mandate except to recognize the value in what other people are doing, even if it's not what you might be inclined to do on behalf of liberty. Various strategies are likely to be successful in different environments. Experiment, see what works, listen to what other people have to say. What I'm sure of is this. Working together, we can help to create a world in which free people can live together in free, vibrant, creative communities. That's the world anarchists want. Not a world in which chaotic violence robs people of freedom and security. That's the world some snide commentators seem to think anarchists seek. But a world in which the absence of the state's dominion creates a breathtaking variety of empowering, liberating ways of being human. Not a world ruled by states and the elites that control them and use them to dominate, exclude, and impoverish, but a world in which ordinary people are free to flourish. Now, we can't tell yet just what this sort of world will be like, but that's because it doesn't exist yet. It's a world we're going to fashion, a world that's waiting for us to bring it into being. That world lies beyond the state's violence, beyond its support for hierarchy and impoverishment and privilege, beyond its repression of difference, and its suffocating elimination of the offensive and the dissenting. It's not a perfect world. It will still be populated by human beings, by you and me, but it's a better world, a world more free, more powerful, more peaceful, more humane than the one we live in now. See you there. Richard, do we have time for questions, or need to move on to the next? Okay, okay. So let's take two or three questions. Go for it. Uh, I love everything you say, but uh, talk about preaching to the choir. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I think there are lots of different methods. Let me just give a plug for, for one represented by the Center for a Stateless Society with which I'm very proudly affiliated. C4SS has engaged in an aggressive campaign to get anarchist op-eds into the pages of national, uh, national media outlets. Uh, notably, our uh, uh, researcher uh, Ross Kenyon got something into the Christian Science Monitor recently. We're very proud of that. Uh, what we're doing, in effect, is normalizing anarchism. Anarchist perspectives on a range of political issues are making it out there. We're not uh, uh, including op-eds that just argue for anarchist theory. We're offering anarchist analyses of particular public uh, events that are attracting a lot of attention. And what we're doing is helping people to come to see the anarchist perspective as legitimate and part of the conversation. Is that the only strategy? Of course not. We're also engaged in education. We run a program offering a certificate in anarchist theory and practice designed to pre prepare activists to share ideas with others. We also run uh, a program that creates detailed policy analyses that uh, have been delivered especially by our amazing research associate Kevin Carson on a regular basis that look at everything from industrial organization to labor struggle to health care. 
we're fighting the battle of ideas that way. Am I suggesting C4SS is the only model? Of course not, but it's the one that I happen to know well, and I want to plug the strategies we're employing that I think are, uh, are making a difference. Lots of other options, too. I think the use of drama, of uh, film, that we're seeing uh, as an option here this weekend is an amazing one. There are people who will watch a movie who would never pay attention to uh, a detailed political tract, and I hope people are, are paying lots of attention, will keep paying lots of attention to the documentary and dramatic films that are being produced here. Lots of other options, but I think there are some great ones already on the table. Time for maybe one more question. Les? Uh, I don't I don't want to make it too. I don't want to make it too long and complicated. So let me simplify it as far as possible and keep the answer as possible as you may need to. Uh, a society in which we each can experiment differently mm -hmm. does sound wonderful. There does seem to be there has to be some minimal agreement between people, it seems, to allow that kind of experimentation. Yes. I'm thinking of the fact that there are different property systems. Because yes. You know, anarchists in particular, we're going to use the the broad philosophical range. You mentioned anarcho primitivists, and I assume anarcho syndicalists with different ideas on right and wrong on property. How do the experiments occur? I think the experiments occur because people belong to communities and networks, and those communities and networks, while they might be responsible for helping people to maintain their own visions of uh, how property systems might justly work, have to get along with others. It's going to be the case, I think, that those different networks and communities will negotiate agreements with folks with different property rules that will govern disputes between them, and I think there are both economic and moral reasons for them to find equilibrium points uh, that will minimize conflict. So that's what I would expect there. Okay, thank you very much. Great to be here.